Welcome to my talk. I'm Ludwig. I'm working for SUSE in the Future Technologies team. And today our topic is converging image and package-based operating system updates. So first let's take a look at what image and package-based means. So in, for example, in the embedded world, or also like with phones, it's normal that a Linux system is deployed as an image. That means the image is basically built on server side and then downloaded as a whole and deployed as a whole. That means it's usually either a complete file system like a partition or a tarball that gets extracted into some directory. The image contains a full Linux system. So including probably kernel and all libraries and uh, installation typically requires a reboot. Um, on a more traditional Linux system, as we know from the desktop, Normally you have a package base, so the individual components are built as small bits packages and you can decide which ones you want to install. So for example, if you need to update OpenSSL, then you just update OpenSSL. If the software supports it, you would just restart individual components. Also the client, in this model, the client decides um, what components are needed. So you don't deploy the whole system but there's a solver on the client side that decides which packages you actually need to update or install. So the installation does also not necessarily require a reboot, depending on package. If you update the kernel, of course, then you need to reboot to, to activate it. So the, the goal is somehow to combine the, the pros and cons of, of more or less the cons of both approaches. And one of the early ones is OpenSUSE MicroS. So let's take a look on that one. So with microS, there are 10 boards that can update the system without influencing the running system, um, which means you, you can safely prepare the updates, reboot once, and everything is activated. Back then, when microS was created, um, it had to work with the existing packages from that time. So what I show here is the file system layout that was chosen for microS to make it both transactional and work with existing packages at the same time. So what it ended up with was a read-only root file system where the operating system is in slash and user and also boot included in the root file system. And since the root file system is read-only, ETC is on an overlay FS, so you can still modify config files. The data is on a separate partition in our volume and var. So this model has the advantage that the existing packages required very little change. Basically only var has to be excluded from, from being shipped by packages. All the rest is unmodified since ETC is an overlay FS. Packages can put config files there. Scripts can run and modify ETC. And still all of that gets activated only on next reboot. Also, uh, Interesting property of this model is that the bootloader is snapshotted. So traditionally the kernel and initrd are in slash boot and also grub. So this will be part of a butterfs snapshot. And when you choose to boot an older snapshot or roll back, the bootloader would also be rolled back. The, the disadvantage of this model, in my opinion, is that this overlay FS on ETC is kind of a hack. And it also gets more complicated the more snapshots you have because they have to be recombined and stuff. So it would be better to find a better model. And in fact, modern Linux systems look more like this nowadays. That is also what I explained in last year's talk that you can still watch on YouTube. So the goal here is that the operating system is read only in user. After the user merge, that is actually possible. We have slash and etc on a writable volume and boot ideally is the ESP on UEFI systems. So it's not a separate Linux file system or it's not part of the root or user file system. This is really just the ESP. Also in this model, var is on a separate partition or volume to host the data. So with this image based layout, as an operating system vendor that, that is based on RPM packages, we would still build the images using packages, but those packages that are deployed via the image 
obviously can't ship stuff outside of user because it's limited to user. So that also means that scriptlets that typically do modifications or migrations in ETC or VAR can't work because if you deploy an image that only contains user, there's nothing that, that runs basically. It means packages need to be adjusted for this for this model. For example, update alternatives because it has links into ETC and VAR can't can't be used. So we have alts for that. Also stuff like the permissions package won't work because user is read only in this model and the permissions package reads a config file and then wants to modify user that is mutually exclusive. So what has to be done here with the packages is to switch to methods that activate changes only on next reboot or service start. For example, systemd presets to enable units or sys users to create users. Also, what needs to be taken care of here is slash boot. Previously, we had the kernel and the init ID in slash boot, so the packages kind of took care of that. Now, when we just exchange user, we have to manually put the kernel uh, and the entity in slash boot. So typically the, this, this model is implemented by having partitions. So when you install updates, you can switch between different versions of user. That has the advantage that user is really read only because you can even put it on a file system that, that has no write operations. It's rather easy because partitions um, already exist, so GPT is not very complicated. Another advantage would be that you can use rsync or ca sync to deploy updates. So if you want to lower the, the bandwidth requirements for downloading, you could borrow blocks from the previous version of the operating system. And another advantage of this image-based uh, AB method is that the whole image is, is signed. So you can put a GPG signature on the whole image and can even later verify it on the raw block device, basically. This advantage would be that there's no deduplication. So all versions of the operating system consume space, even if, if the update process could borrow blocks from the other one, on disk they would still be duplicated. There's always a limited amount because you, you can't have an arbitrary amount of uh, partitions because they have pre-allocated space. So you, if you know that your image is five gigabytes, you would have five gigabytes times N, depending on how big your disk is, and you basically never change it. Okay, so since we are SUSE, we use ButterFS. So we could deploy this, uh, use this same method on a ButterFS volume instead of a partition that gives us one disadvantage, that is that the read-only state is uh, just a, a flag in the ButterFS subvolume, but has the advantage that we gain data sharing. So um, to create a new or download a new version of the operating system, you would clone the existing one and then use the copy and write properties probably to, to only update the blocks that, that are actually needed or the files that are actually needed. And with that one, you can also use rsync or ca sync for deltas, of course, to sync between arbitrary versions of the operating system. And the additional benefit is that you have a flexible amount of versions available. It's not strictly limited by your, your disk size, but more on how big the updates actually are. So if an update just opens, uh, updates OpenSSL, then it only needs a very small amount of, of space. So you can have more old versions. A question mark is on the verification because it's no longer a block device that you can easily verify with one GPG signature, but I will talk about that in a minute. First, let's take a look how the ButterFS subvolumes could look like uh, in such a setup. Obviously, the current method that we have with slash dot snapshots uh, for snapper won't, won't work because now we have two volumes, uh, the one on, for the root file system and user. So there was a proposal on the system mailing list from last year to name the subvolumes in a discoverable way, similar to how it's done in the discoverable partition specification. So for example, for Tumbleweed, it could look like a subvolume called root with the architecture and the, and the name of the distribution. 
And then since we have multiple user volumes, we will put some version number at the end. This is just a proposal. I'm not sure if that will be the final one that is still up for discussion upstream. But the big problem that, that we talked about was uh, verification. So how to solve that one goes along with introspection. So images that we build are made of RPMs and RPMs are actually signed. So we can verify by means of GPG the RPM headers of every single package in the system. And RPMs, the RPM headers contain a list of files and uh, check them for each file. So by verifying the header and then walking the files listed in the header, we can make sure that the checksums match. And that way we end up being able to verify the full user tree, the full operating system using this method. And we can make sure that no file was modified, no file was added and no file was removed. So in the end, we also gain verification by means of RPM. The big uh, disadvantage is that the RPM database is a binary blob and it's actually proprietary to RPM. You're not supposed to open it and do something with it because it's uh, internal. So even when the backing database is SQLite, whatever is in there is, is not for external programs to look at. So many images that get shipped actually remove the RPM database because it's considered not too useful. Just a big binary in there. Does it have to be that way? I don't think so, because if you really look what it what RPM is doing, for example, in SQLite, it just inserts the RPM header into the database as blob. So it just writes the RPM header, whoop, it's in the database. So if you do that, you can just as well write it into the file system, a separate file, right? And then what's left from the RPM database is just a bunch of indexes for a faster name lookup, and that could be put in var. So we could replace the RPM database with just a directory of RPM headers. And now suddenly we can basically RPM-QA by means of LS, we gain a feature that allows us to diff what is in different snapshots. So if you look at the old one and the new one, just look into this directory where the RPM headers are and you immediately see what changed. In contrast to now, if you use snapper status or whatever it's called, then you see hundreds and thousands of files, not just the, the few packages that changed. And by having the unmodified RPM headers there, yeah, we still have user fully verifiable with GPG. So now that images are based on RPMs and the full operating system content is RPM based and we have the RPM headers in the system, what do we actually need the image for? I mean, in the end, the whole user tree is defined by a list of RPMs. So to, to deploy the image, we don't really have to download a full tarball or yeah, QCOW or whatever. We could also just download the, in, the RPMs individually and unpack them in user. After all, they, they can't really run scripts anyway. So it's kind of equivalent to RPM dash, dash I and no, dash dash no scripts. With probably a plugin that limits the, the files to user. Disadvantage again, or the, the, what we lose would be arbitrary deltas because RPM payload is compressed. So we can't really borrow blocks from the old version of the operating system. In our traditional systems, we have delta RPMs for that. So on server side, there's a pre-computed delta between a specific previous version of a package. But that needs pre-computation on server side and it only works with the versions that the vendor defines. So if you have a, if you forgot to update for a few weeks or months, then you may not be able to use deltas anymore. Can we fix that? Yeah, we could use uncompressed RPM payload. That would be similar to, to an image that is stored uncompressed on server side. And if we have uncompressed payload, we can even do a magic trick and align the 
the files in this payload to, I think it's page size, and then we can use this IO control uh, file dupe range to even link files into the payload. So you no longer have to copy files out of an RPM, but you put the RPM there and make the content appear somewhere else. That means the, the whole system would unfold from this directory of RPMs. And in the end, user is just a view on a directory with RPMs without much space requirements. Now, if we want to update this, we would normally uh, clone or snapshot the, the user tree and then run, run rsync to, to update the list of packages. And then we would have to fix up the tree to actually match the installed RPMs. So if, if the version of the library changes, then you have to remove the old file and add a new one. That's complicated code. It would be much easier to always create this view from scratch. And that could be done by changing the butterfs subvolumes a bit. So uses just a view. So we, to update a system, we would just snapshot this sysimage directory, update the list of RPMs in there, and then create a new user volume space. And that is really easy. And reflinks actually work across butterfs subvolumes. So, stream the RPMs into its directory, create a new subvolume, reflink them in there super quick. Does this actually work? Or is it just a pipe dream? It does work. So, I created a prototype, proof of concept. I linked it here on, it's on GitHub. I wrote a small program called RPM to Extends that takes existing RPMs as they are from, from factory, from Tumbleweed and converts the payload to, to this reflinkable format. It's basically just raw and aligned to, to page size. It uses server-side solving. So using libsolve on, on the server, you can define um, your system. It's like a, it's a solver test case, basically, for those who know that. And then the server just offers a directory and the client uses rsync to, to download that. So it's just like an image. It's, well, the difference is that we don't put an image, just a list of directory, uh, a list of RPMs in a directory. For this prototype, I patched BusyBox because BusyBox already has an RPM header parser and fixing RPM itself is rather cumbersome. So this is just a few lines of code and BusyBox can install those reflinkable RPMs. And to make the system bootable, um, I use systemd's kernel install script that copies the, the kernel of the of the new image into slash boot, uh, generates an init ID and a few other things. So if you want to try, go ahead. Uh, there's also some documentation. I just didn't want to show a demo here because it's always <laughs> not working. So um, ready for, for a product, right? Not quite. We still have some things to do. And first of all, we need to fix packages. The user merge is, is done, just a few maintainers that didn't respond to Bugzilla yet. But the big change that is still required is to get rid of files in etc and var. So I think I will file a tracker bug at some point and file bugs for all packages in the base system that still have files in etc. We need to find solutions for those. So either the software has to be patched to actually look into user, for example, using libeconf or using the system D temp files mechanism, something like that. Also, we need to get rid of, of scriptlets. Some of them are harmless, like ldconfig. Uh, you can safely ignore that. But if there's packages that really convert data in etc or var, then they need to move that out of the RPM pre-post into some, something else that probably needs to be defined, something that we can call on, on boot or service start. An example of that is, for example, SSH. So the SSH server does not generate the keys in post, but instead there's a service file and that generates the keys on first boot. And that's basically how other packages also should do it. 
What also needs to be done is to standardize on those ButterFS volume names. That is something upstream is interested in. And um, also the RPM reflinkable payload is discussed upstream. Is not just my idea, but independently, someone from Meta also had this idea. So I think we should find a way to use the same payload format, even if RPM itself doesn't support it yet. We need to enhance or fix system these kernel install script. It's not really made for this use case and it cannot deal with snapshots as is from upstream. So we need to provide some, some enhancements there. Then a big unsolved, but I think solvable topic is the rollback of slash or ETC. MicroS does that natively by design because it's all one volume. But when you have um, slash and ETC on a separate part of a sub volume from user, then a rollback of the operating system would not roll back the configs. In fact, I think no other image based system does that. So you just go back to an old version of the operating system and that's it. Doesn't handle config file rollbacks. I think by somehow storing the operating system version related to to the state of ETC, we can solve that somehow, but it certainly needs research and work to do that. Also, we need to reconsider using CA sync. So my prototype so far uses rsync because we thought CA sync is dead, but as upstream said, it's not. It just lacks a proper maintainer. So <laughs> if you want to use it in a product, we can actually hire someone to do that. Upstream would be more than happy to, to have a maintainer. Last but not least, to make this work, we need to adjust the package management stack. So RPM and SIP, for example. RPM is a tough one for sure, but can be done. Okay, what what else on the topic? Um, there's some things that that are worth reading. For example, the bootloader specification that is required for them for slash boot. And the discoverable partition specification helps to understand uh, where this is coming from. Uh, last but not least, my talk from last year, where I explained the user merge and how current Linux systems are supposed to look like. And to summarize, I think we can build image like systems leveraging ButterFS and not doing it like everyone else with those fixed partitions. The behavior, even if it's package based, is very similar to image based systems. So you could download a, a fixed set of packages that, that, that define an image, but it leaves the possibility to also do the solving on client side, however you would like to do that. Could be even combined to download a, a base set of packages and then put local packages in addition, that would work without hacks. So unlike, for example, RPM OS tree, which has to play tricks with links to add some local packages, we could just put another RPM in this directory and the, the view, this user view, would just adopt it. No hacks needed. Yeah, that's it basically from my side, pretty quick. So any questions on that one? Dirk mentioned that the RPM database is NDB, not SQLite. Uh, yes, I mean, the RPM backends are pluggable. Uh, RPM has support for multiple. So in SUSE, we use NDB, but you can also use SQLite, of course. And the way RPM handles that internally is pretty similar. It tells the database backend to store RPM headers in there. The SQLite one has the advantage that you can actually look at it and see what RPM is doing without using RPM code. Then Alberto has a question how to work on standardizing the RPM pre post scripts to take care of new packages, upgrade packages, package removal. 
Yeah, good question. Um, I think we need to look at the, the use cases. Some of them are clear. For example, LD config, I think, can be dropped either completely or in favor of file triggers and very similar anything that handles systemd unit files. I mean, this is this is just text that you write there repeatedly. It's not needed. You, you can use file triggers for that. Same for uh, MandyB updates, info pages, desktop files. All of that can be removed from scriptlets and be converted to file triggers. If you put the file triggers in separate packages, you can omit, can omit them for such image-based deployments because they're not needed there. If actions are required on boot, like, um, I don't know, if a, if a PostScript needs to update some cache in var, then we should discuss where to store that. So we could put all those generator scripts that are normally called by file triggers in a specific directory, and then the system could know that it needs to execute that whenever a new version of the operating system is installed.